I, I used to think that it, the important people sat in the front row to show how. Good afternoon. I'm extremely honored to introduce Paul Wingard as the Picard lecture this lecturer this year. Um, of course, Paul really doesn't need any um, introduction, but I would do a little bit anyway. <laughs> um, so um, Paul is currently the Vincent Astor Professor at uh, Rockefeller University. So throughout his scientific career, um, Paul has made numerous uh, breakthrough discoveries, and he uses a combination of um, protein biochemistry and pharmacology. Um, he elegantly um, elucidated the signaling cascade following um, dopamine binding to its receptors. He um, demonstrated that protein kinase A activation um, as the result of increased intracellular psyche AMP levels lead to phosphorylation of a central molecule known as um, DAP32. And um, this can turn DAP32 into an inhibitor of uh, phosphatases, which have profound consequences on um, um, downstream signaling um, pathways and um, synaptic plasticity. And um, his elegant work concerning signaling transduction in the nervous system led Paul to be the recipient um, of the Nobel Prize in uh, Physiology or Medicine in the year of um, 2000. And um, Paul is also the recipient of um, numerous other awards and honors. Um, too many to mention, I'll just um, name a few. Um, the Metropolitan Life Foundation Award for Medical Research, the Charles A. Dana Award for Pioneering Achievement in Health, and the Karolinska Institute's Bicentennial Gold Medal, among uh, many others. He is also elected member of the National Academy of Sciences and the Institute of Medicine, and is the honorary member of the National Academies of Science in Sweden, Norway, and Serbia. So among many other beautiful research endeavors, about, I think, a decade ago, um, Paul identified a really cool molecule known as P11. Um, and um, he's done lots of, lots, lots of beautiful work show that uh, P11 plays a central role in the regulation of um, mood. And his recent work demonstrates that this effect of P11 is mediated through its, its interaction with um, chromatin um, modifying um, enzymes. So um, today, um, Paul will tell us about um, understanding uh, in search of the molecular basis of major depressive disorder. Paul. So please let's welcome. I wish I could tell you the understanding of the molecular basis of major depressive disorder, but that's why I said in search of. Uh, so most of my uh, academic career has been dedicated to trying to understand the molecular mechanisms by which nerve cells communicate with each other. And at the time we began our work, the prevailing paradigm was that neurotransmitters released from their presynaptic terminals activated ligand operated ion channels on the postsynaptic membrane, causing an increase in either sodium or chloride ions and a commensurate uh, excitatory or inhibitory signal in the postsynaptic uh, target cell. And this has turned out to be absolutely correct for a handful of uh, neurotransmitters, most notably uh, the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate and the inhibitory GABA. But uh, what we found was that the vast majority of neurotransmitters and neuromodulators work through a much more complicated system involving activation of a receptor which initiates a intracellular signaling cascade. And in you know in, in the years since then, there's hundreds of these pathways and they're so complicated nobody can possibly understand them all. But that what these what these slow what these this is, we call it slow synaptic transmission and the more classical type fast synaptic transmission. I like to think of it as the f fast transmission being the hardware of the brain and the soft trans so, uh, slow transmission as the software which mediates not only the actions of the particular neurotransmitter or neuromodulator but provides 
the basis for integration of information coming in from different nerve cells to a given single neuron. So recently, because there is so much known in the literature now from hundreds of laboratories about all these pathways, I thought it'd be interesting to see if we could learn something about the etiology of various neurological and psychiatric disorders and about the mechanism of action of various drugs used to treat these disorders based on the information that's accumulated in the field. And the four diseases we've been looking at are the two neurological diseases, uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, both of which are neurodegenerative, and it's psychiatric disorders, uh, specifically schizophrenia and depression. And I thought today I'd like to just focus on uh, uh, our work on depression, major depressive disorder. Uh, this is a occupied intellectuals or thinkers from time immemorial. If you think about the Iliad by Homer, where Achilles sat by the, his boat for 10 years waiting out the Trojan War because Agamemnon took his girlfriend away from him. And uh, this is a common theme in literature. Sometimes the girl having her boyfriend taken away from her. And there are all sorts of other reasons for a major depressive disorder. Uh, <laughs> I just can't think of any offhand, but so uh, oh, I forgot to turn this on. Could you hear me so far? Oh, yeah. Oh, good. Somewhere in here's a that's my cell phone. Where do you put that thing? It's in some pocket. Be careful, I'm married. Uh, here. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Eva. Yeah, it's on. It's okay, good. Thanks. So it won't get any louder. It turns on. It. No, it sounds louder now. Uh, so th there have been various great writers, musicians, and and painters who have dealt with this theme. And although it's not straight science, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about it. But um, how do I control the slide advancement? Do I? Do you control that or? Oh, it's over here. I didn't do very well. We're going to be here a while, folks. Brought to you by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Sorry. <laughs> really advanced electronics here. <laughs> so I, I guess you're going to have to advance it using this using little arrow. Okay. okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, this slide just reminds you that it's, it's by far the most prominent psychiatric disorder, major depressive disorder. And uh, amongst the artists that have dealt with this theme, I particularly like Edward Munch, a great Norwegian painter. As I'm sure you all know, there's a very high incidence of suicide and major depression in the Scandinavian countries. He himself was depressed. He had many friends who were depressed. And uh, one of them, his major themes was this uh, loss of his loved one. So this is either Munch or a close friend that scholars debate which. And that's his girlfriend. The problem is she has to be this fellow's wife and he persuaded her to come back to him so here's monk alone by the seashore and he has a he did a woodcut of the same thing but to, to show a equal opportunity he did the same thing for some women here is another painting of a young lady uh, less is known about the origin of that painting but again she's by the seashore disconsolate here she is another woodcut uh, this is a self-portrait 
a monk in a cafe in Oslo with a bottle of wine, and you can see beautiful evidence of major depressive disorder. Here are two very lonely people. This is a painting probably everybody in the room knows. There's a whole series that he did of this with a scream. Uh, he did this in black and white, too. Uh, this is, a, uh, again, you know, one of the major uh, phenotypes of major depressive disorder is uh, early morning awakening, and here he is a self-portrait of the night wanderer. A very, very moving uh, painting. Here's despair. And I think he uses the same bridge, but in this case, it's a man. Lonely, and you see these two people in the background. Workers on their way home. Uh, and uh, this is the last of these. So this one, a lot more is known about. So are these people obviously very depressed. And here's Monk. He's not only depressed, he's going against the flow of humanity that's walking this way. This is on Karl Johannstrasse, major street in Oslo. So now I'd like to turn to our own humble efforts in this uh, area. Uh, so I start by summarizing for you. I can't, I can't read now. Maybe will this move up without my breaking it? Or? It's a lot of warners and stuff here. I'll be, I'll be able to read it better. So this just summarizes some of the things we know about uh, uh, the pharmacotherapy of MDD. All antidepressants require several weeks, in some cases months, before they work to reach therapeutic efficacy and have many side effects. I've not finished with that one yet. <laughs> so, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs, are the most effective antidepressants for the treatment of major depressive disorder, and they have therapeutic benefits in about one third of all patients. The results, um, these results have focused attention on possible abnormalities in serotonergic uh, transmission MDD. Uh, it's generally thought that, that there's a deficit in serotonergic transmission, but it could just as well be that there's a hyperactivity of some opposing pathway and that you could get clinical benefit by raising the serotonin level to abnormally high levels to, to counteract the opposing transmitter. Two-thirds of all patients respond to some form of treatment, including uh, SSRIs, the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, the tricyclic antidepressants, all of which have as a component of their action increasing serotonergic signaling, electroconvulsive shock treatment uh, with an unknown mechanism. That leaves one third of all patients refractory to all known uh, antidepressant <coughs> treatments. And because they, uh, based on the efficacy of SSRIs, we undertook a search using U2 hybrid technology for an endogenous protein interacting with serotonin receptors. We reason that since the serotonergic signaling pathway is so important, there might be endogenous modulators. And uh, we means uh, uh, Pierce Fenningson, uh, who was a postdoctoral fellow in the lab. He's now a professor at the Karolinska Institute. And Mark uh, Flagele, who's an assistant professor in, in our research group. And using the serotonin 1B receptor as a bait in this E2 hybrid uh, system, they discovered this protein P11 it was actually a known protein but it was not known to have any function in the nervous system. It's a member of the S100 family of proteins, it's actually S100A10 is its number. And uh, uh, the work we have done suggests it and the pathways it synthesize and break it down as, as therapeutic targets for major dis depressive disorder and uh, cognitive impairment. So this slide, one of the first things they did was to look for, see whether it's co-localization of these proteins since they interacted in yeast, if there's any validity to this, they should be in the same place in the brain. And you can see here the co-localization of the P11 in this upper panel and the 1B receptor in the lower panel in various brain regions in coronal sections.
Oh my God. I'm pushing the wrong one. There we go. So the next thing they did since they interacted in yeast system and, and co-localized was to see whether the uh, P11 might have any effect on uh, serotonin receptors and they found indeed that it did control the trafficking. What it did is cause accumulation of the receptors at the plasma membrane. We're studying now whether this is due to recruitment of the receptors or a prevention of the endocytosis of the receptors. We don't have the answer to that yet, but I think it's going to be on the endocytic pathway side. So here you can see uh, this is a cost cells transfected with the receptor alone or with the receptor plus P11. And you can see there's a doubling of the uh, amount of the receptor at the surface, no change in the total amount. What's it? Oh, I keep it in the wrong one. So then we, we did a series of studies to see whether P11 might be involved in serotonin signaling. And as you can see here, the P11 facilitates signaling. We, uh, I should have said, there are two major serotonin receptors. There are three altogether, two major ones where P11 plays a major role. Uh, and that's the 1B receptor, which is a GI-coupled receptor, and the 5HT4 receptor, which is GS-coupled. And this slide shows, for example, P11 facilitates, facilitates signaling through the 5-HD4 receptor in primary cortical neuronal cultures. So here, for example, the, uh, in the wild type animals, you see with the five, four agonists, the, it goes up and then the knockout cyst is totally abolished. We then on, went on, or Mark and... Uh, and pair, pair did to show the indeterminance of these two. For example, if you change the mood in mice, you get changes in P11, and there's very good correlations in men of mood to the changes associated with P11. Um, here, for example, antidepressant treatment increases P11 message. Uh, if you use fluoxetine, which is the generic name for Prozac, uh, uh, and uh, or, or a mipramine, a tricyclic antidepressant in mice, or electroconvulsive shock in rats. In all cases, there was an increase in the P11 message. And uh, we also found that P11 message and protein are down-regulated in depressed patients and in mouse models of depression. This is a Rouen mouse uh, model of depression. It's really a great model. And, they com and you can compare the depressed phenotype with the family, with the related uh, not depressed mouse. They were outbred from a common pair of mice, and it's a very powerful <coughs> model. And here you can see in the depressed mice, is a 75% decrease in the pillar of mesh. It's really huge. We've gotten smaller effects in postmortem brain tissue. This shows this slide shows the reduced P11 expression in the anterior singlet cortex of patients. Uh, There's in situ hybridization. Um, so not only could you change the behavior of a mouse to get the change in P11 level, but we were able to manipulate P11 levels and regulate dramatically regulate susceptibility to depression. It's measured by various molecular, electrophysiological, and behavioral tests. So here, for example, uh, this summarizes the fact that mice expressing P11, overexpressing P11, are hypo hypoactive, as measured by, excuse me, hyperactive as you measure by an increase in horizontal activity. They are less anxious, as shown by this decrease in thigmataxis, and they're less depressed, as shown by this uh, Im decrease in immobility and tail suspension test. And we did several other tests on these. So we also looked at the knockout mice, and not just the overexpressing ones. And what we found was that constitutive P11 knockout mice are depressed and fail to respond to antidepressants. So those are two major phenotypes. Uh, and so we began to see whether, what P11, how P11 might be involved in the signaling. And here the 1B receptor is a, a GI couple that causes a decrease in cyclic AMP, a decrease in PKA, and a decrease in uh, uh, phosphorylation of ERK and phosphorylation of synapsin 1. Uh, this is a synaptic vesicle protein which plays a major role in regulating a neurotransmitter release. And and I, I just uh, the example, the results are the same for both of those proteins we looked at. But here, for example, you can see that uh, the serotonin receptor 
uh, media dephosphorylation of ERK-1-2 is abolished in the P11 knockout mice. And this, 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 this effect of the, uh, uh, is, is uh, prevented in the, uh, yeah, I should have said the empyrlene, yeah, that's a, a, a 1B agonist. Uh, and uh, this is abolished in knockout mice. So we did one, we meaning uh, Karima Shergui, uh, did a study uh, showing electrophysiological effects of P11. It's, it was well established the cortical striatal neurons uh, have glutamate as a neurotransmitter. The glutamate is released, activating receptors on the postsynaptic cell. Uh, this is measured very precisely with FEPSP. And it's known that the ser serotonin released from serotonergic neurons uh, activates the uh, 1B receptor, and this inhibits further glutamate release. So we wanted to know whether this step might be mediated through P11, and it is. Here, for example, this is a, a postsynaptic response. When you apply serotonin in a wild-type animal, you get a nice depression of transmission, and in the knockout mouse, uh, it, this is totally abolished. And so we could... Uh, put P11 in this scheme here. There's still details to work about how it's mediating it, but it is mediating it. The, this yes, slide shows that fluoxidine-induced antidepressant effect is abolished in P11 constituted of knockout mice. So here you can see that uh, the effect of fluoxetine in the wild-type animal, a, a decrease in latency and a novelty suppressed feeding. So that this is an antidepressant action, and this effect is abolished in the P11 knockout mice. So to summarize what I told you about these global uh, P11 knockouts, you have a depressed phenotype and then diminished antidepressant response. It turns out this is, these two are due to different types of cells in the brain, different types of P11 cells in the brain. And this next part of the story was uh, were carried out by Jennifer Warner Schmidt, a postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory with Pierce Fennings in white described before. And uh, the pathway, this was mostly known, but we were able to plug P11 into the system. So you have the SSRIs, uh, increasing serotonergic signaling, activating receptors, increasing the, uh, uh, one of the targets for the receptor BDNF, the neurotrophic factor, which then activates its uh, uh, receptor tract B. This activates MAP kinase. And what they were able to show is this, through P11, increases neurogenesis and causes behavioral improvement. And I'm just going to show a few examples of that. So here's the same scheme up here. I just illustrate here what, what this experiment refers to in the pathway. So in this slide, as you can see, BDNF induces a P11 expression in primary neuronal cultures, and they're fairly robust effects. Uh, this effect of... Uh, 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 I'm sorry, this slide shows the BDNF increases P11 to track B receptors in primary neuronal cultures, so that here we took uh, primary neuronal, neuronal cultures from the two types of mice, and here you can see, I'm sorry, this is one type of mouse, and here's a P11 protein increase in response to BDNF in, in, in these cultures, uh, these are wild type mice cultures, and here in the presence of a track B antagonist, you totally abolish the, uh, the effect on P11, so that puts this upstream of this one puts, it, puts the uh, BDNF uh, map kinase upstream of P11. In whole animals, the BDNF regulates P11 levels in mouse cortex. So you can see here in BDNF knockout mice, both the P11 protein and a message are uh, decreased in the knockout mice, and conversely, in overexpressing uh, mice, uh, there's an increase in both. So this slide shows that it says that serotonin increases P11, uh, that this serotonin increase requires BDNF. Uh, so here, here's a, I was getting ahead of myself before. So this is primary neuronal cultures, either wild type or BDNF knockout mice. And here you can see this is time in the presence of serotonin. There's an increase in uh, P11 in the wild type animals, and this is totally blocked in the knockout animals. In fact, the ba in the absence of serotonin, the... Uh, level of P11 is lower in the BDF knockout mice compared to the wild-type mice as predicted by this scheme. 
And, and this slide demonstrates that the antidepressant-induced effect on neurogenesis, which has been well established in many laboratories, also requires P11. There's a couple of markers. This KI67 is a marker of cell proliferation. So there's stem cells in the granule cell layer of the dente gyrus of the hippocampus. And, uh, and when you apply fluoxetine, you get an increase in the cell proliferation. And you also get a, uh, I'm sorry, there's a, a different thing. Right, yeah, oh, this is a BDNF induced effect on antidepressant behavior. And here you can see it in a wild type animal. It's a very uh, clear cut antidepressant action. And this effect is abolished in the knockout mice, uh, demonstrating that uh, P11 is required for this BDNF induced antidepressant behavior. In fact, this is even higher than this, which again is predictable by the model. So then I'd like to tell you, it's, it's, it's sort of a side story in a way, but in a way it's uh, very much on target and, and clinically extremely important. We started studying anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, 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 because I was at a meeting, an NAMH retreat, where there was a fellow, uh, Miller from Emory University, who's a clinician, and he reported there, which I hadn't known previously, that people suffering from major depressive disorder have extremely high levels of plasma cytokines, several cytokines. And so we decided to um, uh, see whether anti-inflammatory drugs, which regulate cytokines, might have any effect on, on uh, behavior in response to anti-inflammatories. And as you can see from this conclusion, anti-inflammatory drugs do indeed reduce therapeutic efficacy of antidepressants. And this is where, again, Jennifer I described and Kim Van Over. So this is a summary of what we found. The SSRI antidepressants raise serotonin. They improve cytokine. They cause an increase in cytokine levels, which activates P11, which causes behavioral improvement. And the NSAIDs, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, by blocking the serotonin increase in cytokines, impair behavioral improvement. <coughs> they can even prevent it. So here, for example, uh, I can't see either of these slides. Uh, so the, okay, this slide says NSAIDs attenuate behavioral response to SSRIs. So I need a, all kinds of different glasses. Let me see. <laughs> You'll be here someday. So tail. <laughs> <laughs> so here is uh, these open bars representing it. It can, it can control can. I'm sorry, no, I'm saying this wrong. Here's citalopram and here's fluoxetine. Here's the vehicle injection and here's citalopram and fluoxetine causing this big decrease in immobility and antidepressant action. In the presence of ibuprofen, Advil, uh, there's this great attenuation of the therapeutic effect in these mice. So then we wanted to know which cytokines might be involved and two out of two so far we've studied are both involved. Uh, both interferon gamma and TNF-alpha injected into animals cause uh, huge increases in P11 expression. Uh, so here we're looking at this step here. More impressive is that if you knocked out the receptors for either interferon gamma, uh, well, the receptor 1 or, or the TNF-alpha receptor 1, you abolish the effect of the uh, antidepressant. So here's so talipram, a very widely used SSRI. And here you can see in wild type animals, you get this increase in P11 protein. This effect is abolished in animals in which these cytokines are missing. And so it's the same thing, not only with the P11, but with the behavior. Uh, here you can see the same story. Here's the talipram, uh, causes decrease in the uh, latency to feed and antidepressant action, and these effects are also abolished in mice in which uh, either the interferon gamma receptor 1 or TNF-alpha receptor 1 are knocked out. So there's no question that this pathway is, is dramatically involved in, the, in this signaling. So I thought there was another slide in here. Oh, yeah, there is. Okay. 
So when we had these results, I thought it'd be interesting to see whether this had any cl clinical relevance. And there's uh, a study uh, I'm sure that many of you know about, it called the STAR-D trials. This is sponsored by the federal government. It's one of the few things left that is. And uh, uh, it, what they're doing is comparing various antidepressants because it's a huge burden uh, economically to to pay for all these uh, drugs and they want to do these comparisons. So it's, this is, it's done in about 20 centers throughout the country and the headquarters are in uh, UT Southwestern uh, where a fellow man named Maduka Trevey, uh, a clinician scientist, has been doing these studies. And I asked him if we could have access to the data on these patients. They, they had self-reported whether they were taking any other drugs. So they were giving the, the, the different drugs. This is citalopram in this study. T comparing these drugs, uh, <coughs> uh, excuse me, com comparing, all patients got citalopram for six weeks and people just self-reported whether they were or not taking any other medication and some of them said they were, for, for example, taking an NSAID, that could be uh, one aspirin in the whole six weeks or it could be, you know, ibuprofen three times a day or anything. That was all lumped together and even so the data are amazingly dramatic. So as I said, these are all self-reports. Uh, the, the remission rate amongst people who said they had not taken any anti-inflammatory was 55%, which is pretty standard rate. And w those who had reported taking an, uh, an NSAID, it dropped to 44%. With no analgesic, it was in another this, the trial, it was 54%. And if they had took any analgesic, that would be the NSAIDs or, for example, uh, a Tylenol or other non-inflammatory analgesics it dropped to 37 percent. So these are huge effects in clinical trials because typically when you compare a very effective antidepressant agent with a placebo, there's about a 20 percent difference in patients. So it could be that a large part of the refractory population is due to their having taken uh, one, an anti-inflammatory. And this is very common amongst older people. Uh, they they uh, are depressed and they have arthritis. So is a very high incidence of, of administration of these two types of drugs. So we um, recommended that in, in the paper we published on this that, um, that uh, physicians consider seriously asking their patients to stay off, uh, if they could stay off these anti-inflammatory drugs and analgesics, but at least it, would they please, they're, we're doing a prospective trial now and and asking them, please, if they want to be on one, they can, but they have to be on that one drug at the same regimen for the six-week period. So hopefully that'll give even clearer data. I neglected to mention, this was one retrospective study. We did another one with very similar results, even slightly better than this. So uh, this, uh, this is the story I was talking about. These, these are the two pathways that I mentioned we have some evidence for, or very strong evidence, actually, where the BDNF uh, 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 track B map kinase pathway uh, requires P11 to produce its neurogenesis behavioral effects and also this pathway where serotonin and cytokines blocked by NSAIDs uh, are upstream of P11. So one of the things we're now trying to do is see whether the BDNF track B map kinase is upstream of the cytokines or vice versa. But this should be fairly easy to get the answer to. So now I'd like to talk a bit about the identification of the brain region involved in P11-induced no uh, depression, excuse me, P11-knockout-induced depression. And this work uh, was done by Michael Kaplan, who had been an MD, PhD at Rockefeller. He's now a professor of neurosurgery at uh, Weill Cornell. And the, the Brian Alexander was his, uh, is his, actually uh, is his resident. Uh, well, I should say was his resident because between doing the study and doing the hours he have to do as a resident in neurosurgery, he decided he didn't want to do neurosurgery anymore. So Michael was very happy about the paper, but he was unhappy he lost this guy because he, he, he decided to become an anesthesiologist instead. <laughs> That's a true story. In fact, I only tell true stories. So, uh, so as this slide says, uh, a decrease in P11 in the nucleus comes, increases vulnerability to depression. Uh, what they did was you know, put M, uh, well, shRNA in various regions of the brain, and uh, I've done it again. <laughs> so 
So they, so they did, they put the SHRNA into various regions of the brain and found the nucleus accumbens. When you knock it down there, you got this, uh, thank you very much. The depressed phenotype uh, here, for example, this is putting the uh, PA, PLMSHRNA in and looking at various tests. So here was a, this caused an increase in immobility in the tail suspension test and for swim test and in the stigmataxis test too. So, uh, <coughs> conversely, you could take the P11 knockout. So, the knocking out P11 in the nucleus accumbens mimic the constitutive knockout. And conversely, you could take this constitutive knockout and put P11 only back into the nucleus accumbens, and you got this dramatic reversal. So, here by these two tests, you have, uh, uh, if you compare uh, the wild type with a P11 knockout, this large uh, increase in immobility. And this effect can completely be reversed by uh, administration of uh, P11 mRNA into this region of the brain. So to summarize this bit, uh, the depression seen in mice totally lacking P11 can be mimicked by uh, removal of P11 only from the nucleus accumbens. And conversely, the depressive effect seen in mice totally lacking P11 can be corrected by addition of P11 only to the nucleus accumbens. So we then wanted to know oh, which cell type was oh, but I just had one slide in here to show you that P11 expression is also reduced in the nucleus accumbens of uh, post-mortem uh, depressed human patients. So then we wanted to know what cell type in the nucleus accumbens uh, is involved. Was it a single cell type or not? And it turns out it is. Uh, this work was done by Jennifer Warner Schmidt, who showed that P11 levels in the chat interneurons of the nucleus accumbens are the cell type that determine vulnerability to depression-like behavior. So this is uh, immunocytochemistry. Uh, the upper panels are low magnification, lower panels high magnification of these ins of these uh, areas here. So she looked at the at the uh, um, P11. This is immunocytochemistry for P11, and for the chat, the cholinergic acid transferase, which is a very good marker for these chat cells. And you can see the merge. Almost all the P11 is in these cells. And this is say, true in both the dorsal and ventral uh, striatum, so the nucleus accumbens in particular in this case. And here you can see this. So it's very clear all the P11 is in almost all these ones. So there is a low level in the uh, medium spiny neuron project the projection neurons, uh, but uh, it's nothing compared to this level. And uh, the same story in humans, the P11 in the nucleus accumbens of the humans uh, it, it, the P11 is localized in these chat cells, as shown here and here again at low and high magnification. Um, so then we st started manipulating the P11 in these cells, and this slide shows the deletion of P11 in chat cells, the nucleus of Cummins. Uh, I won't go into the detail, it's clear that we knock it out, and you can see from the merge also that it ain't there. And so then we study what happened with selective depletion of P11 from these chat cells, and indeed, uh, uh, you can see that when you just knock out in this one cell type, you get a very dramatic depressive phenotype in both the sucrose preference test and the fourth swim test. So then we did the converse. We restored P11 to the chat cells and the P11 knockout mice, uh, as shown here. And and then what you found was the following. So here's the the uh, wild type mice, and if you uh, the P11 knockout mouse has the depressive phenotype. If you put the P11 back only into the chat cells, you get a complete reversal of this phenotype. So to summarize this bit, the depression seen in, P in mice totally lacking P11 can be mimicked by removal of P11 from this one cell type, and conversely, the depressive effect seen in mice totally lacking P11 can be corrected by addition of P11 to this one cell type in the nucleus accumbens. We've not seen any other region of the brain where we can get this uh, effect. It seems to be the only cell which is responsible for this uh, <clears throat> phenomenon. However, as it says here, selective depletion of P11 from these chat cells does not reduce the behavior response to an antidepressant. Here you can see the antidepressant effect in the wild type animals and in the mice where the P11 was knocked out selectively in this one cell type. So we can add to this story then the fact that we could mimic 
the depressive phenotype by removing P11 from this one cell type in this one small region of the brain, but we could not mimic the antidepressant response, so then we undertook a, a, a search for what cell types might be in account for this phenomenon. And it turns out that in contrast to the depressive phenotype, which can only be produced in this one cell type that we studied so far, uh, and it seems unlikely that it's going to be any place else, there are several cell types where, uh, uh, are, that are responsible for this. And in fact, if you remove P11 from any of several cell types, uh, you, uh, you lose the uh, antidepressant response. And the first of these studies, the first region that was studied was done by Eric Schmidt, a postdoctoral fellow in uh, the laboratory of Nat Heinz, my colleague. And uh, what, uh, what Eric found was that P11 levels in cortical projection neurons determine response to antidepressants. So this shows P11 uh, localization at coronal section of the mouse brain. You can see the laminar distribution and at higher magnification, this is what you see in these regions of the brain. Uh, here for, this is, these are layer 5A neurons which project to uh, lower parts of the brain. And you can see that the P11 is all uh, localized in this one cell type. And so we began to study the biology of these projection neurons. And here's P11 message level, effective fluoxetine. It's not a big increase, but it's statistically significant, showing that fluoxetine increases P11 message in mouse cortical pyramidal neurons more dramatically, there's a huge effect on the 5-HT4 receptor in these cells. This is a log-2 scale, and so this is a 16-fold increase in, in the level of P11 in these cells. Uh, and uh, none of the other uh, um, serotonin receptors are affected by fluoxetine. And this increase, I don't think I have a slide to show that the increase is not seen in the P11 knockout mice, so this is definitely downstream of the P11 effect. Yes, yeah, so not only that effect on the serotonin receptors, but the effect on, on behavior requires the presence of P11. So here is the effect of fluoxetine in the novelty stress feeding and in the tail suspension, tail suspension test. So here you can say in a wild type animal, this effect of fluoxetine, the antidepressant effect here and here, and this effect is not present if you knock out P11 from these uh, cortical projection neurons as shown here and here. So we now add to our story that the cortical layer 5A projection neurons, uh, they, I don't, they don't have a depressive phenotype, uh, but they do have a diminished response to the antidepressant. And as I said, there are other areas uh, which do the same thing. Uh, it, it particularly uh, interesting is the dentate jars, where, as this slide indicates, P11 in the dentate jars regulates both neurogenesis and depression, especially in response to antidepressant agents. This was the work was done by Young Suk Oh and Young Kim. And uh, as shown here, uh, the, the regulation of fluoxetine, uh, by fluoxetine of neurogenesis in wild type P11 knockout mice, uh, you can see that here's the effect of fluoxetine in the wild type animals, and this <coughs> this is a um, cell proliferation, cell survival. This is the same uh, ks 67 here and B, BRDU here. You can see the increase in both of these measures of uh, neurogenesis, and this effect again is abolished. These effects are again abolished in the uh, uh, P11 knockout mice. So we then wanted to know where in the where in the uh, dentate jars the P11 is localized, and it's localized in three types of cells: the, uh, the glutamatergic uh, mossy cells, which are excitatory, and two types of GABAergic inhibitory uh, interneurons, basket cells based on their morphology. Uh, one type contains parvalbumin, and the other one contains CCK, and they're all co-localized in, in the cells. That, that they're co the evidence is very good that they're in the cells that I said they're in. So calretinin is a very specific marker for mossy cells in the dentate jars, and here you can see the uh, co-localization of P11 with the mossy cell marker here. Same story for the basket cells. So this is the sort of overall picture with the 
with the dentate chars. There are granules cells here, they are stem cells which turn into granule cells which then differentiate into full blown neuro neurons which project to the CA3 uh, region of the hippocampus. And then these are regulated by this excitatory pathway, the mossy cells, which have axons that terminate on the dendrites in the in the uh, intermolecular layer. Yeah, the intermolecular layer. And, uh, and you can see these here, they're staying down here. Here you can see the cells in the hilus and their terminals in the intermolecular layer. The basket cells are right at the junction of the hilus and the uh, granule cell layer and these are stained here in green, so you can see them right at the board. These little bright dots are those cells, and the projections make this whole layer. The, uh, th these are uh, axonal soma somatic projections, so they make this layer green. And when, it, when they're put together, there's a very clear laminar distribution of these excitatory and inhibitory cells. So that's what we have to work with. And when you put on fluoxetine, you get a large increase in the P11 positive cells, and this is attributable to an increase uh, shown quantitatively here in both types of cells. So here you see these excitatory mossy cells in the hilus and the intermolecular layer have a much a higher level of P11, uh, and similarly the basket cells or these GABAergic interneurons have a much higher level in the uh, granule cell layer. So. <clears throat> This slide then says that, and I didn't show you much of the data for this, but in the dentate gyrus neurons that I talked about, uh, knocking out P11 uh, causes the depressed, does not cause the depressed phenotype, but it does mimic the global knockout in causing a diminished antidepressant response. So we then wanted to know how is it working, because here, this seemed nice area to work with in some of the other brain areas, because we had both neurogenesis and uh, and behavior to, to look at. And most people in the field agree the neurogenesis is required for most actions of the antidepressants. It's slightly controversial with the proponents of opinion is that the neurogenesis plays a major role and we belong to that school. So uh, how does P11 achieve its actions on neurogenesis and behavior? And this is again work of Young, Suck and Young, plus Dinshaw Patel who's a very uh, He's a great structural biologist, and this is his postdoc, Pu Gao, and he worked with us on this project at Intro and, his, and Pu. So this was known, it was known that the active form of P11 is a heterotetramer composed of, uh, of a uh, dimer of P11, it always seems to work in a dimeric form, with two monomers of an X and A2. And so we began to take, we, we, began to, we took the, this heterotetramer to see what would bind to it, and what we found, this doesn't show up very well here, three major proteins, uh, ANAC1, SPT6, and SMARCA3, and the evidence that the physiological relevance of this is that if you made a, this mutation in P11 at C83, uh, so that you could no longer form the heterotetrameric complex that had been shown in other laboratories, that you no longer got these three proteins binding. So we now have these three candidates, and there are others that are less definitive of the evidence that they're binding proteins, but these three are enough to work on. In fact, we've concentrated on the SMARCA3, which is a well-known chromatin remodeling factor, and uh, it turns out that there's this, the, the binding region of ANAC1 and SMARCA3 are, have a lot of consensus in them, the, uh, and they, they bind to the P11. The ANAC1 uh, does not have this sequence, there's a different sequence in it that binds, and it binds to the NX and A2, not the P11. So anyhow, we chose to go on with uh, the SMARS-A3. That's the one I'm going to tell you about now. And it turns out that so you, the, if you did this P11 and X and A2 heterotetramer interacts with the chromatin remodeling factor SMARS-A3, and when it does, uh, I'm sorry, oh, here's the structural biology that uh, Din Chou and Pu did. So uh, what they, they use the peptide of the, uh, of the uh, small A3, and here, uh, this is the crystallization of the three types of proteins as the NX and A2, two monomers, here's the P11 dimer, and this is a, a ribbon view, and here's a space filling view, and here's, this is two amino terminal ends of, the, they form a, a hydrogen bond, 
uh, and it, they fit in this groove in the heterotetramer. And when they do that, uh, they activate the smart CA3 so that it increases its binding to DNA. So here you can see this is the amount of, of smart CA3 ba bound to the uh, DNA in the absence of either a, a P11 or an XNA2 or the NXNA2. If you add the heterotetramer, you get a, a large increase in binding. Uh, an X, uh, the NXNA2 doesn't do it, nor does P11 alone. And, this, and then this, uh, in, in turn, caused an activation of the SMRSA3 transcription activity. So that here you can see uh, in, in COS7 cells, if you use a SMRSA3 plasmid, you get a, a large increase in the transcriptional activity. And this effect is abolished again in the knockout mice. So then we ask, well, where is this SMRSA3? Let us pray that it's in the same cells that the P11 is and our prayers worked. <laughs> They're in the same cell type, so here, here's the P11 and the smart CA3, and there's a merger, a merge, uh, showed both P11 co-localizing with smart CA3 in both the mossy cells and the basket cells. So now it turns out that smart CA3 is actually required for the fluoxetine-induced neurogenesis, which may give us confidence that we we're on the right path here. And you can see the uh, the wild type animal uh, that uh, that fluoxetine had this increase in neurogenesis, and in the smart A3, this is a constitutive knockout. It did not. And the same thing is true for behavioral improvement. Here, the uh, the uh, novelty stress feeding is shown here, and sucrose preference shown here. These antidepressant actions were abolished when you in the uh, smart A3 uh, knockout mice. So this is a summary of what our current thing is about this particular part of the story, that the antidepressants, that the antidepressants by increasing, uh, by activating serotonin receptors, cause an increase in peel. Well, this is all experimental data that's shown us that, based on experimental data. The serotonin receptors activation causes an increase in P11 message, which causes an increase in P11 protein, increases an XNA2 message in protein, and I showed you at the beginning of my talk how the P11 protein caused a, a recruitment of serotonin receptors to the plasma membrane. We're pretty sure that, that the NXNA2 is involved in this thing is in the form of a heterotetramer, but we don't have the definitive evidence for that yet, so I left it out of the scheme. Now this is all, <clears throat> this isn't really accomplishing anything on targets, but it's an amplification mechanism by which the uh, actions of the serotonin get amplified. In other words, first, one of the first things you do is you increase these levels of these guys, and then that causes more receptors to be here, so it it's a signal amplification device, a positive feedback device. <clears throat> but the real action is downstream of here, with the, with the heterotetramer binding to small CA3 and to these other factors. And in this particular case, with the small CA3, it causes a, a change in chromatin, a remodeling, which allows an increase in gene a transcription. You get increased neurogenesis, you get improved behavior. We think that the neurogenesis is very much a necessary part of the improved behavior. So some of the things we want to do next are, are shown in this slide. I mentioned some uh, during my talk. We'd like to identify all the genes that are regulated by SMAR CA3, <coughs> and this should be fairly straightforward. And be done in a finite amount of time. There are many genes that are regulated from small cell safety just looking at the literature. Next, we'd like to determine which of these genes, uh, regulated genes, contribute to neurogenesis behavioral responses. And that's going to take a lot longer because we're going to have to knock them out and overexpress them and see which ones are on this pathway. And we're trying to go down this signaling pathway to see how far you have to go or I can go in accounting for the antidepressant behavior. And then, <clears throat> for example, if you find a certain gene it's an enzyme, we can knock that out. That has a subset you can knock that out and see just how far you can go down the pathway. One problem that does bother me is when would we have the answer? And I really don't know the answer to that because like how you can go down 17 steps and say we can now 
all this is involved in the depressive pathway, you know, this and this and this going on in this cell, but which, who are we? Which are the cells where we say, oh, we're depressed? And I don't know how you get to that one. That's just an overwhelming thought. I went, Francis Crick once talked about something like that, and he said, he was explaining at a lay lecture about uh, how the brain works, the visual cortex, and he said, this is, you know, it's like a television of the, of that, the visual cortex is re represents it image of what's out there, you can think of it as a television set. The question is, who's watching the television? It's the same thing, who's being depressed? And how one answers that, I have no idea <laughs> yet. Uh, oh, is another uh, thing we're working on now is to try to clarify the intracellular communication mechanism by which the uh, P11 smart C3 uh, containing mossy cells and basket cells regulate neurogenesis in stem cells. The stem cells do not have P P11 or NX and A2 or SMARS A3, so this is not a cell autonomous effect. <clears throat> so we're trying to find out whether this is going to be doing an increase in increase or decrease in glutamate release or from mossy cells or GABA release from the basket cells, and uh, or whether it's some growth factor, or whatever. But that's what we're one other project we want to work on next. And finally, we'd like to determine the role of other uh, uh, heter tetrabinding proteins, specifically starting with NEC1 and SPT6, but as I mentioned, there are others that are weaker binders, but we think they're real. Um, and finally, before closing, I'd just like to tell you about two clinical studies we're doing. Uh, uh, one, we're using uh, P11 in diagnostic trials. What I didn't tell you is that antidepressants increase the level of P11 in the brain, and they also increase the level of P11 in the immune system, in the white blood cells, there was literature for a long time now that P11X is a cytokine within the uh, immune system, so it, it is an important component of communication between different white blood cell types. And so it turns out when you give an antidepressant, you raise the P11 in the brain and in these white blood cells. So now we're trying to find out exactly how that works, but uh, the antidepressants raise it in both and and uh, and so we're doing uh, clinical trials to see whether we can predict efficacy of antidepressants. And so far, it looks very encouraging. Uh, we're, we're, we have a clinical trial going on where we're comparing patients where, who had a substantial therapeutic improvement and those who didn't, seeing what what correlates with P11 levels, and that that's looking very encouraging. That data. And the last thing is that we're we're hoping to start very some clinical trials. Uh, I put genetic by virus injection into the nucleus of cumbens. Michael Kaplan, who I mentioned, has done this kind of trial before in some Parkinson's disease studies, and so he's in good stature with the FDA. And we not only have this in mice, we also have in monkeys uh, some very dramatic effects. Uh, this had been done with some people at NIMH. Uh, they found in one study that everything, every animal they looked at was very encouraging. But one, they had two female monkeys together. They fought all the time. They hated each other and fought. After three days of injection of P11, they became absolutely adoring each other, affectionate, grooming each other. One of my colleagues said, you have found the lesbian gene. So, <laughs> uh, I know that's true. But anyhow, the fact that there's a large number, of one third of all major depressive disorder patients, a lot of patients that are refractory to any known treatments, and we're hoping the FDA will give us uh, um, permission to do gene therapy with P11 into the nucleus accumbens of, of the, uh, these depressed patients who are refractory to current depression. Thank you. Talking about three pathways. Sorry? I, I don't know what 
you're referring to. Oh, you had a slide that had A, B, and C. They had three different hat that you showed. Do you remember where on this lecture it was? Yeah, it was towards the beginning. So it was after the slide. Um, it's not more. It's yeah. This one? No, it's lower. It's a summary slide. Right. Yeah, right here. This one? Right. So are these pathways correlated with the location of P11 in the brain? We don't know that. I mean, I show you evidence that both that, that both pathways, the, the BDF track B map kinase pathway and the cytokines are involved, but we don't know which is upstream of which. And we don't, it could be that one, I don't think it can be that. It, it could be these are in different cell types, but I think it's more likely they're in the same cell and that we just have to find out which of these is the right pathway. Because these were independently done. And with the, you know, this is pretty easy to do, I think, by just regulating the level of the cytokines and see if it affects BDNF and changing BDNF, see if it affects cytokines. We just haven't done those experiments yet. My guess is, to answer your question, that is in the same cell types that the, the whole system goes on. Yes. Paul, um, has anybody looked at the distribution of P11 in fetal brains? Because lots of women are taking fluoxetine, and probably also during when they're pregnant. Uh, we have not done anything like that, no. Nobody's looking at the, at the developmental distribution of this brain? I only know what we're doing. <laughs> I, I, I have not heard about that yet. I mean, it's a very important point you're making. Uh, it I, I, what, what does the literature say about fluoxetine and, and uh, fetal problems? Is there anything on that? What? I mean, do doctors advise pregnant women against taking SSRIs? I mean, this must be in the epidemiological literature. If it is, I mean, it's a very important point you're making, if it is, we should be looking at P11 and fetus to see if it might be involved. Thank you for that suggestion. Oh, I have a question. So, um, the function of P11 in regulating the um, serotonin receptor levels uh, versus the nuclear role of P11, do you think they are related or they are separate functions? I think they're separate. I think the, the receptor thing is just an amplification system and then lots of other things happen downstream just one of which is this story I told you today with the smart thing three. So That's there are several one. different pools of P11 in cells or? There's, we haven't, well yes. Uh, we know that, uh, the story I didn't tell you about, P11 and the next A2 go in from the cytoplasm into the nucleus ah. uh, together. They have to be together. They won't go in alone. The smart A3 is an in the nucleus, was made outside that goes right back in, so you don't detect any in the cytoplasm. But they, the, the, uh, they, there's a very rapid shuttling of P11 next and A2 between cytoplasm and the nucleus, and so the, it's obviously involved there in this nuclear, uh, the chromatin remodeling. And so mm -hmm. on. But the other stuff that they, is going on in the exterior, the cytosol and the plasma membrane. I see. So the, it's the same molecule is doing both. Mm -hmm. But I don't think one is just to amplify the serotonin signaling, that is to do the real action of the antidepressant. Uh, yeah. So, one of the caveats of the neurogenesis. Could method, you talk a little louder, please? So one of the caveats about the neurogenesis model of antidepressant uh, and depression is neurogenesis decline with age so much that you would almost predict that younger mice are less than older mice, and that once you age to an extent that neurogenesis is almost depleted with these mice or patient stars. So you're saying that neurogenesis goes down with age and yes. depression goes up? Would, would that be a correlation? That you it would be. I, I didn't even n know about the neurogenesis. Well, I guess I didn't know about it. I never thought about that connection. And it's a perfectly reasonable possible explanation for the increased depression, the loss of neurogenesis, absolutely. Yeah, and you had a question. Well, I was wondering if you could um, 
Do you want to comment at all on the corticoidal side or hippocampal side of this versus accumbens part? They seem like two sides of your story. Yeah. Well, okay, the, the question that Dr. Graville asked is about was there any connection between the hippocampal and the nuclear Cummins stories. I, I, the most simple explanation is that, that the, the cells in the cortex and the hippocampus are somehow either, well, they're actually not, we tested it. We want to see whether they were innovating the, uh, the nucleus accumbens chat cells, and they're not. So that means that they're, that they're innovating something that is also being innovated by the nucleus accumbens cells and overriding the depression you get from the, from the uh, nucleus accumbens deficit. That's not unusual. In the case of Parkinson's disease, the cells that die, the dopaminergic cells die, we don't treat those dopaminergic cells, not yet. I mean, hopefully, with all the research going on, the world will be able to someday. But we do it, we replace the levodopa, so we're actually treating the projection neurons in the striatum. And this looks like this, a similar thing. The, these cells that are deficient in the nucleus accumbens, you can you deal with that by having pathways, also P11 containing pathways that work downstream of the nucleus accumbens. So that, that's our thinking. Yes? It's somewhat related to that. Um, you mentioned about 5A neurons in the cortex. About how many? Uh, uh, 5A neurons in the uh, Oh, they're 5A, yeah. 5A. And um, do you know where they go besides the accumbens? Because in the amygdala, it's also the yeah. major pathway to the amygdala. We know. We know. Yes. But I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> no. Where they go is they go to the contralateral side to the dorsal stratum. Yes. And they go across the other side of the cortex. But we don't know what they do there. We were hoping they would go to the nucleus accumbens, but unfortunately. It would have made our story much simpler, but it's much more complicated than that. So, so that's why I was mentioning to Anne that you know they have to be innovating something downstream of where the Nucleus accumbens is projecting someplace, and presumably these other P11 containing cells are, are going there too. The amazing thing to me, it's almost a philosophical question, is why both of these cell types have P11 in them? You know. Okay, if there's no more question, that's thank Paul for the